Welcome everybody. We are so glad to have you with us today for our Meet Your Museum program. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum and La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. For the next few weeks, our Meet Your Museum programs will be presented in partnership with Los Angeles County Office of Education's Engaging Girls in STEM initiative. We're going to be highlighting some of the amazing female scientists, researchers, and curators at La Brea Tar Pits, sister museum to the Natural History Museum. If you're interested in viewing closed captions in English or Spanish during this program today, please click the link that will be dropped into the chat box. Today, we're meeting with a special guest from our museum. The Natural History Museum and La Brea Tar Pits and Museum are home to over 35 million objects and specimens. And these collections are used to conduct research, put on display in exhibitions, or play a part in programs we develop. Each staff member has a special area of focus for their work, but together they're helping to build and share the history of life on our planet. Pretty cool. In just a moment, we're going to hear from Dr. Myreen Belisi, postdoctoral fellow at La Brea Tar Pits. A postdoctoral fellowship is a research position at an institution after someone has received their PhD. Dr. Belisi has worked with fossils from La Brea Tar Pits for over a decade as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley studying locomotion or how animals move, as a master's student at the University of Michigan, testing resource partitioning among large Pleistocene or Ice Age carnivores, as a PhD candidate at the University of California, Los Angeles, quantifying injuries sustained by the saber-toothed cat and dire wolf, and in 2018, as manager of the Tar Pits Field School. Uh, now, she is funded by the National Science Foundation and co-sponsored by UC Merced to conduct postdoctoral research on small to medium-sized carnivores, also known as mesocarnivores. These carnivores, carnivorous megafauna, or larger carnivores such as saber-toothed cats and dire wolves, had become extinct by the end of the last ice age, but mesocarnivores like coyotes and bobcats remain with us to this day. She is investigating how these extinctions and climate transitions shaped the mesocarnivore community over the last 40,000 years, and by extension, our Los Angeles community today. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can meet our presenter today, and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Dr. Blasey. Hi, Rachel. So good to be here today. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so sharing my screen. Oops. Let's backtrack. Try again, share my screen. All right, are we good to go? Go for it, we can see your screen quite well. Thank you. So um, as Rachel said, my name is Myreen Belisi and I am a postdoctoral research fellow at La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. And my specialty is carnivorous mammals, which I'll talk more about um, uh, later in this talk. Um, I'd like to start though with, you know, what I like to think of as my origin story. I mean, everyone has an origin story. At the moment, um, I am in Los Angeles um, and we are, um, you know, I'm part of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, but I am originally from another place. So I'm originally from the Philippines. Uh, my family and I immigrated here um, to the US, um, but I was born and raised in Manila. And um, so, you know, as Google Maps says here, it's about a 14 hour, 55 minute flight away. And um, so it's a very different place from, you know, from the United States, from Los Angeles, but also similar in some respects as um, I'll try to show you in a bit. So if you zoom into the Philippines, you'll see that it's very lush. Um, so here's where I was born and grew up, uh, the yellow star. And here the orange star is where my family is originally from. And so, um, the, the northern part of the Philippines. And so um, as a child, I got to take a lot of road trips with my family. Um, so during the summer and during the holiday breaks, um, we would take that, you know, maybe it was a seven hour road trip or so from the yellow star to the orange star. 
And um, the Orange Star, the Northern Philippines, is um, where I first got to see um, some nature. So this is Kalau Cave, uh, which is a series of um, about 300 limestone caves. And um, I didn't get to explore them very much as a child, um, but I remember my mom um, brought me to them and that was, um, you know, I, I didn't really know what, how to deal with them at the time or how to react. It was just this, um, you know, this massive uh, mystery to me. I didn't really have the perspective, I think, to um, figure out what was, what was going on with these caves because um, these caves were not my everyday. Instead, this was my everyday. So, um, so I grew up in the capital of the Philippines, which is Metro Manila. And it's a very urban environment. So we had this out map where you saw from, you know, a Google Earth imagery that um, it was very lush and very green, but that was a bit far from my everyday reality, which was this very urban environment. But even as a child growing up in this very, um, you know, in, in this relatively congested um, city, um, there were already signs that um, I would end up doing what I am doing now. So for example, on the left there is, you know, me as a kid um, wearing a cat shirt. Um, so cats are carnivores um, and are some of what I study today. Um, my mom, who's shown in the middle photo, was a biology teacher. And um, she was more fond of plants, but, um, you know, just that, that fondness for, for life um, got passed down to me. And also my grandpa, who was um, one of the first people in my family to immigrate over to the United States back in the 70s or so, um, every time he went home to the Philippines um, to come visit us, he would bring back stacks upon stacks of National Geographic magazines. And so as a child, I was, I was really lucky to, um, to have these magazines to look through. Um, and, uh, you know, the photography was amazing, as you can see in this cover image. Um, and this National Geographic really was the first time that I saw um, what was beyond the city that was, you know, right around me. Um, I would say, though, that uh, National Geographic was awesome, but, you know, these were still images in pages, right? Trapped in pages, if you will. And um, I think that's, that's, kind of different from actually doing, um, from actually doing um, science. And um, so when, so fast forward a few years, uh, my entire family moved over here to the United States and I got to go to school at the University of California in Berkeley, um, which I didn't know uh, when I started attending there was a really great school for paleontology. And uh, one of the reasons for that is, well, here is a photo of the clock tower, the Campanile at UC Berkeley. And there is actually a bunch of fossils in this tower um, because this tower was being built at the time that excavations here at the La Brea Tar Pits were happening. And um, at the time, there wasn't really a museum down here yet. And so a lot of the fossils from down here in Los Angeles went up to UC Berkeley and um, ended up getting stored in this clock tower, this Campanile. And so here's an example of um, a tar pit fossil that um, is up north. And I'll, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of questions like what are carnivores and what are tar pits? I'll get to those in a moment. Um, but basically by going to UC Berkeley, um, I was really uh, fortunate to have, um, you know, to, to be able to work on these tar pits fossils right in my classes, and also to be able to um, be mentored by some of the people whose work, you know, gets into National Geographic, things like that. And so, um, yeah, it, I think that it really makes a difference to, you know, to have good mentors. Um, and uh, so through, um, through their support, um, I went from uh, my college degree at UC Berkeley went on to the University of Michigan to get my master's degree. Um, and there I continued working on tarpets, uh, tarpets fossils. 
So um, this was a poster from my um, thesis defense back in 2011. Um, wow, 10 years ago now. Um, so on dietary behavior and resource partitioning among the carnivorans or carnivores of late Pleistocene Rancho La Brea, which is um, another name that we have, the, the scientific name for the La Brea targets. And so, um, and after I did my master's, I went back to Los Angeles. Um, you know, I really, I, I kind of think of it as, well, I got, I started working on tarpets fossils and like those fossils, I got stuck at the tarpets in a good way um, because I just kept coming back for more, right? So, um, so I was in Michigan when I came back to Los Angeles um, to do my PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology um, and um, worked on other stuff. But now I am back officially at the La Brea Tarpets and Museum as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral research fellow. And um, we are part of the NHMLA and I've done both, I've done work at both institutions. And um, yeah, so I think that Ranch La Brea um, is a really unique cross locality. We are in a, uh, well, I'll actually talk more about that in a moment. So some questions that you probably have at this point, um, a talk about tarpits carnivores, right? So what are carnivores and what are tarpits? Well, the first question, um, so carnivores, this is what we call mammals that are in the order carnivora. So they are not all carnivorous. So um, scientifically there's, you know, a bunch of different ways that we use the, the term carnivore, um, but uh, the way I use it, um, carnivora um, or carnivores, which are uh, members of the order carnivora, spans a gradient of meat consumption. So when we say carnivoran or carnivore, um, we mean not just carnivorous mammals like leopards and polar bears, but also omnivores like the raccoon and even herbivores like the red panda and the giant panda. And in this talk, um, I'll try to say uh, carnivoran when talk, referring to the taxonomic group and carnivore or carnivorous when talking about the dietary adaptation. So for my PhD dissertation, I focused on dogs or members of the dog family. So, um, so this includes, you know, not just domestic dogs, of course, our pets, but also their um, close relatives like coyotes and foxes and uh, wolves. And so um, I think Rachel will drop a question maybe in the chat or so. Um, but our question here is which continent is the dog family from? I've just dropped the poll. So folks, I see already a lot of students responding, but I'll share the results. I'll give everyone a few more minutes to answer your question. Do you think dogs from Africa, Antarctica, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, or South America? And I think that, yeah, and I think that whatever answer we end up getting will be interesting. So I'm really excited to see what you think. For sure. I'll give students about five more seconds or so to get their answers in. I see some people dropping their ideas in. Alrighty, I'm gonna share our results and I'll pop off screen. Thank you, Rachel. Oops. Can you see those on there? I can read them aloud too, if not. Oh, okay, I think that would be better. <laughs> sure. So. Our, our, our winners, we actually had a tie. Um, our students thought that dogs may have originated from either Africa and 22% of folks saw Africa or North America. We had 22% of folks guessing North America. Oh my goodness. Um, that's really cool. So um, 
I'd like to talk about the Africa idea first because um, that's, yeah, a lot of people, um, that's what a lot of people say when I ask this question. And I think that's really interesting because um, uh, Africa is a center of, you know, it's a hotspot of biodiversity today. Um, we think of Africa as having, oh, they have the lions and all these other um, really wonderful animals. Um, but actually the answer is North America. And I also think it's interesting that, you know, about half of the, um, yeah, about the same proportion answered North America. Um, so yeah, millions of years ago when dogs originated, um, North America was a very different place. And um, yeah, so dogs are originally from here, the earliest fossils that we have are from here. So um, millions of years ago, North America was a biodiversity hotspot um, and still parts of it are. Um, but yeah, I think we're just not used to thinking about it that way. Um, but the fossil record really shows um, otherwise. Anyway, thank you for that. And um, so going back to the presentation, um, North America is the um, home continent of dogs and a bunch of other animals as well. So let's go back then to North America, uh, specifically to LA. Um, so LA, home of the tar pits. Um, here we have our um, site, the um, Hancock Park um, in the Miracle Mile neighborhood of Los Angeles, so a very urban site. And um, you, know, you might be noticing, um, I talked about having grown up in a very urban environment um, uh, in the beginning of this talk and we are still in a very urban environment today um, in this, you know, uh, this is a fossil locality um, that is in the middle, that this is an active excavation site that's in the middle of um, one of the largest cities in North America and the world. And um, so I could, you know, talk for a while about, about just this, but um, in the interest of time, um, I'll just explain that the La Brea tar pits are a bunch of asphalt pools. Um, and this, these are places where asphalt, um, so each tar pit is an asphalt seep, a place where, um, you know, basically extremely crude oil um, seeps up from an oil field under Los Angeles and pools on the surface of the ground. And so um, we are a fossil locality where the dominant mode of preservation is entrapment by asphalt. So in these figures, you'll see um, some, you know, happy herbivores um, getting trapped. So not happy anymore um, up on the left. And then, um, so carnivores go after herbivores or predators um, go after herbivores uh, that are trapped in this case and become trapped themselves. And over um, tens and thousands, tens, hundreds, thousands of years, um, the animals die, their soft tissues uh, become removed by decay or scavengers, and their bones begin to accumulate. And thousands of years later, you know, we paleontologists are excavating those bones. So Rancho La Brea is largely a carnivore trap. Um, as you can see here in this plot, it's mostly, you know, the slice of the pie that's marked carnivores is uh, most of the pie. Um, and this has really enabled studies um, as referenced here on the right. Um, so studies of pathology, so patterns of injury uh, and how those differ between the saber-toothed cat and the dire wolf. Um, and also down here on the lower right, we have um, shin bones uh, that are pathological. So they were broken in life and then healed in, you know, very, um, they didn't quite heal right. So these, these injuries that are preserved on the bones of these carnivores really show us, um, help illustrate how, how these animals used to move um, and how they used to live. So happy to answer more questions about this. Um, if you have them. But so I started working on the large carnivores at the tar pits. Um, but the tar pits also preserve small to medium sized meso carnivores that are still alive today. So they include the coyote, bobcats, cub, badger, gray fox, weasel, raccoon. And as you can see, the upper um, image in this slide is a drawing, right? These are these animals are all extinct. 
and the bottom figures are photos. So these animals are still with us today. And so part of my work at the Tar Pits has been um, uh, working with a bunch of um, students from all over Los Angeles County in order to study these mesocarnivores and really um, tease apart the story, the, the multiple stories that we have here at the Tar Pits. So there's the story of extinction of the large carnivores, but also a story of survival of the smaller carnivores. And so this is uh, a, an area of active inquiry. And so, um, yeah, check back next year for our results. And I think I am over my time. So I'd like to just thank everyone um, supporting this presentation, um, my collaborators, and all of you for tuning in. Thanks so much, Dr. Blasey. It was great hearing about your path. And we do have a lot of questions from students. So I'm going to jump right into there and we'll um, turn off our slide share if that's okay for right now. Perfect. Um, so to start us off, Aiden was curious, what do you find so fascinating about studying carnivores? So, oh man. <laughs> so what do I find so fascinating about studying carnivores? Well, for one, um, so I got started by I got started on the large animals first. And what really captivated me about them was, well, they're no longer around today. And so um, that's kind of weird, right? Like um, it's just, it's something that used to be here. It's an entire community that used to be here um, in this also very urban environment. And it's just very different from what we have today. So, you know, how did that, happen, um, how did, how, how were things so different back then? That makes sense. I love hearing about just the why of, of what interests you with kind of research and studying. Um, Lucas and Chloe were curious, how do you actually date the fossils and find out um, how old they are? Great question. So at the Tar Pits, we use radiocarbon dating. And this hasn't always been, um, there have been massive improvements in the last you know, five years or so um, in this method. So at the tar pits, radiocarbon dating historically was complicated um, by the asphalt. So asphalt itself has, you know, it's, it's basically a contaminant. So it's really good at preserving fossils, um, but the way it preserves fossils, it kind of pickles the fossils, right? So it, it gets into the bone. And in that way, it's also, it also contaminates the fossils. And so when you radiocarbon date a tar pit bone, an asphaltic bone, then you also, um, if, unless you, you know, um, use these specialized methods that are more recent, um, that were recently developed by collaborators at UC Irvine, for example, um, yeah, so you run the risk of dating the asphalt, which is older um, than the bone. So, um, but yes, long story short, we use uh, radiocarbon dating for asphaltic materials. Super cool. Capri and Melanie were curious, what has been maybe the coolest thing you've found or the most surprising thing that you found in your research or at the tar pits? The coolest thing, <laughs> I think that one of the coolest things is um, just the density of bones that we have at the Tar Pits. So I, this isn't necessarily something that I personally found, um, but it's just that, so when we were working, for example, on a study to, so this is me, um, when I was a grad student at UCLA, I collaborated with, um, one of my lab mates, Caitlin Brown, on a study to look at patterns of injury and how those differed or co compared them between the dire wolf and a saber-toothed cat. And oh my goodness, we went through 3,500 bones just to answer our question. And that is unheard of at most every other fossil site. And, um, so those large numbers um, really made it possible to, um, to answer our question because um, what we found was that it's not that animals at the tar pits were getting injured a lot. They were, but, but it's just that, you know, 
because injury is relatively rare, we needed large sample sizes in order to be able to see those patterns. That makes sense. Super neat. This is slightly related. Amanda was curious, are there different people who study um, different types of animals and maybe do they change from like what they mastered in to what they eventually research? Absolutely. So um, at the Tar Pits, we have multiple researchers, both on site, and um, we also have um, many, many visiting researchers. I think we get, you know, maybe at least 60 um, visiting researchers um, in a single year. Um, those numbers might be a little off, but we do get a lot of um, of outside um, scientists as well. And they study a bunch of different things. So um, so my specialty is carnivores, um, but we have herbivores at the tar pits as well. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't, I'm not even talking about the plants, right? We have, we have those two. Um, so yes. So uh, yeah, I think it's, especially when you, um, you know, <laughs> when you get your PhD and things like that, I think the, you're expected to specialize more, but that doesn't mean that that's what you have to do your entire life. So um, people are definitely welcome to, you know, explore after that. And um, for me, I've actually just started to, um, I've just joined a project where I will be working on herbivore teeth. And so um, that's, you know, pretty different for me. Um, herbivore teeth are, you know, they're taller, they're flatter. Um, but it will be, yeah, I, I think scientists always love learning. So I'm excited for the opportunity to branch out. That's awesome. We had a couple of students that were just curious about some of the background for how you do your research and Blake and, and Joyce specifically were curious when you're finding a bone, um, how do you know what type of animal it belongs to? Right. Excellent question. So um, a lot of paleontologists, vertebrate paleontologists. It's 12 o'clock. Oh, sorry about that. Vertebrate paleontologists, especially, they are trained in anatomy as well. So actually a lot of, um, uh, a lot of vertebrate paleos these days are employed as professors and scientists in medical schools and also veterinary schools. So um, so this knowledge of anatomy and specifically comparative anatomy um, really enables people to, you know, just have a, a like a, a reference point, even for bones that maybe they haven't seen before, but then they've seen something like it before, like, you know, a shin bone belonging to a human, right? That, or, or belonging to um, a cat, like those are going to have, um, similarities because uh, they're, you know, they're both mammals. So, yep. That comparative anatomy or comparison is, yeah, super important, more so than I think I even realized in this work. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question and perhaps the hardest question of our time together. Manuel and Ava were curious, what's your favorite carnivore? <laughs> Whew, my favorite carnivore. I mean, I think it's the, mm, I think it's the saber-toothed cat. Um, I mean, I know that's such a stereotypical answer. But <laughs> um, so I did study dogs. So, you know, people might expect, oh, the dire wolf sh should be your favorite. But um, yeah, the saber-tooth is California state fossil for a reason, I think. <laughs> like, it's just so weird. And um and there's, it's been, there's been a lot of studies on it, but there's still a lot that we do not know about it. That is so true. And with that, that's our last question. Um, I wanna thank you so much for your time today. I know we had a lot of questions that we didn't get to, but um, really appreciate you spending time with us. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you everyone. All right. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close out our program today. Thank you so much to our teachers and students who joined us. We learned a lot about tar pits carnivores and the research that happens every day at La Brea Tar Pits. Some of you were even asking, 
Are we still doing research? Are we still excavating? And the answer is yes, we are excavating almost 365 days a year at the tar pits. Even during the pandemic, we have folks that are working at the tar pits safely when they can. So super cool. I encourage you if you haven't been to check out the tar pits um, and you can walk around the park and see our paleontologists and excavators in action. Thank you to our friends and students for joining us this morning. We learned so much about the carnivores at La Brea Tar Pits. If you want to see more from La Brea Tar Pits, you can give us a follow on Instagram at the La Brea Tar Pits. We also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.